Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Georgia Archives educational series, Fourth Friday from the Archives. I'm Penny Cliff, Georgia Archives Education Specialist. In this presentation, we're going to investigate the historical value of diaries and look at some fascinating diary entries. Some of you may have visited the Georgia Archives, some may not. What is it that we do? The Georgia Archives identifies and collects, provides access and preserves Georgia's historical documents. We're the repository of the state agency records focusing on Georgia's state agency records of permanent legal and historic value. We also house private manuscript collections. Now, I'm primarily going to focus on diaries in our private manuscript collections. Private doesn't mean that you can't come in and look at these collections. A private manuscript collection is a collection of historical value that was not created by a state agency. We have a helpful website that is easy to navigate. Notice under featured content to the right of your screen. There are blue rectangular tabs. The finding aid tab will give you access to search our state records. Let's see what we can find by searching state documents using the keyword diary. Here we have an entry. You would not expect many diaries within state records, but it's important to take a look anyway. For, here we go, the Volume 5 Private Journal of the Transactions of the Trustees by Lord John Viscount Percival, First President of the Board of Trustees. For the first 20 years, the Colony of Georgia was under trustees. This was a governing body chartered and appointed by His Majesty King George II of England in 1732 to establish a new colony in North America. Only one trustee traveled to Georgia. This was James Oglethorpe. The other trustees were in London. The trustees hired secretaries in London and Georgia to compile minutes of trustee minutes uh, minutes and meetings, and then in Georgia to share with them about the activities in the new colony. However, John Lord Viscount Percival, the Earl of Egmont, the first president of the Board of Trustees, kept his own private journals for his eyes only. Because the journal was from him alone, there was a candid honesty in what he wrote. There he is right here to the right is the Earl of Egmont. So the trustees elected 15 members to serve as an executive committee called the Common Council with a quorum of eight to conduct business. This is going to be important later on. Um, the corporation governed the colony from London. Sir John Percival, Earl of Egmont, served as trustee and kept a journal of its proceedings from 1732 until May 1744. Remember, these were private. He knew what was in them and nobody else did. Um, we have the journal which we're going to look at has been published and is housed at the Georgia Archives Reference Library. The transcription of the journal of the Earl of Egmont is in our reference library right there. And there it is, right there on the shelf. You can come in and look at it. There is an honesty in diaries. The Earl of Egmont writes in his journal the real reason for three resignations. This is in 1738. So he doesn't think no anybody else is going to be reading this. Uh, this 1738 entry made me think that although this was from the 18th century, certain things stay the same. Nothing new under the sun. As 2021 is called the time of the Great Resignation, this is a timely example. Many times, 
there is the reason people give to resign, and then there are the real reasons. Let me tell you about the context behind this. In 1738, there were problems in the colony, a lot of them. Some colonists were against James Oglethorpe's limits on land ownership, ban on rum and alcohol, and particularly the ban on slavery was the biggest complaint. There was a lot of pressure on the trustees from both sides. Three individuals resigned from their offices with the board of trustees and each gave his reason. This is a private journal. The Earl of Egmont shares in his journal what he thinks are the real reasons for the resignations. He alludes to scripture to pen what he thought was going on. Now I'm going to read a little bit about his comments. He's talking about a Dr. Bundy sent a resignation of his office of common counselor. He said he was no use. I'm no use in this office. Then a carpenter declared to us his resolution to resign for want of time to attend the boards. I just don't have time to get to the boards. And then a carter, when the board was up and delivered his resignation, his business hindered him to attend. Just too busy at business. So let me read what happened here. These like seeds sown on stony ground had no root in themselves and so endured but for a time. He's talking about those who gave the resignation. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arose, immediately they were offended and fell away. He's alluding to scripture here. There was some persecution, it's too much stress, it's like I've had enough. Now he goes on to say the truth. The malicious clamors and reports of the Carolina people against the bad state of the colony at this time, as represented by Mr. John Wesley, the low condition of our cash, the bad but just conceptions of Mr. Coston, to whom the care of the colony was trusted, the great debts contracted by him, and little improvement made by the inhabitants, the unreasonable peak, which though endeavored to be concealed was visible enough, of divers of our members against Colonel Oglethorpe, and it goes on and on. Let me tell you a little of the context. John, this, is 17, this is all going on in 1738. John Wesley served as the rector of Christ Church in Savannah. There was a controversy. Difficulties arising from Wesley's strict discipline with his congregation, as well as an unsuccessful love affair, led to his return to England in 1738. Thomas Coston, who drew all bills on the trustees and directed affairs at Savannah, well, he was not popular. He was not a popular official at all, and he got the trustees in debt while profiting himself. The reasons given by the three men for, right, for resigning, and then the honesty of the Earl of Egmont, who gives us a glimpse into what he believes was really going on. Now, I tend to lean towards the Earl of Egmont's reason. It's just about too hot in the kitchen. Now, if you would like to read one of the Earl of Egmont's journals, the 1741 to 1742 journal is scanned in our virtual vault in the ad hoc collection. The writing is quite nice, easy to read. Our focus today is going to be on private manuscript collections which can be found in the book and manuscript catalog. To search in the manuscript catalog, I typed in diary. If you look on the left, under format, there are 56 books, 40 other, two microform and one journal. We're going to see a few examples of collections from other, which are donated private collections which include diaries. Here is an example of a collection that includes a diary, the Theodore K. Jones World War I papers. In this collection is his diary from 1917 to 1919. This image is from the Theodore K. Jones World War I diary. The entry is at the armistice 
November 11th, 1918. At the end is written, peace at last. Some of the examples we're going to view are two online, which you can see from home, a journal and a memoir, and diaries from collections you need to come to the Georgia archives to read. Diaries are important to people with various reasons to want to read them. They're very important to historians, researchers, genealogists, anyone interested in first-hand accounts from various times in history. Now, a diary is a primary source. It's a document that comes directly from the time being researched. For historians, the use of primary sources is essential to building an argument that can support or refute a thesis. There is a wonderful honesty to diaries, particularly diaries that are not written for anyone else to view. They are open and candid, which contrasts with the obviously self-protective language of official documents. Diaries bring us closer to ordinary people and everyday life as it was really lived than any other kind of document. So let's go over briefly, just on this slide, what historians may research diaries for. All sorts of things, history of class, history of family, environmental history, medical history, history of travel. The topics are endless. Historians and authors also publish diaries, which I have a wonderful example on the next slide. Here is a really good example of publishing diaries or journals. Gathering Blossoms Under Fire, the journals of Alice Walker, 1965 to 2000, by UGA journalism professor Valerie Boyd. This is a compilation of National Book Award and Pulitzer Prize winner author Alice Walker's 50 years of journals. In 1982, Alice Walker became the first African-American woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, which she was awarded for her novel, The Color Purple. Currently, the book is on pre-order with a delivery date of April 12th. 2022. I thought that was a really good example coming up. For genealogists, reading a diary of an ancestor is a different experience from that of a historian. There is the emotional connection of knowing this. This is a family no matter how far back. Diaries reveal who ancestors were as people. And there could be names or dates or descriptions of places or activities. A family historian's job is to uncover the truth. Information found in diaries needs to be handled sensitively. Diaries are democratic. Of course, only literate people kept diaries and letters. But both forms were important to a wide variety of people. You have the rich, the not so rich, young and old, men and women, children. They're the most democratic of all historical sources. Diaries are windows into time. Personal writing reveals how people both embraced and resist the time and place in which they lived. Their personal motives for the written reactions to the time lived. And emotional and intellectual reactions imbued in diary entries about how people reacted to their culture, especially if it was for their eyes only. Diaries and the passage of time. Diaries record the truth as he or she sees it. It's what they believe. Diaries are a distillation of truth in people's lives. But with diaries, what about the privacy issues? There is an unspoken rule. If we see a family member's or friend's diary, we do not read it. We do not invade the privacy of their written thoughts. Now, my daughter has always kept diaries. 
She's a freshman at college and I don't read her diaries. I was going through some notebooks in the house and ran across the diary she was starting. She never actually wrote in it. And when she was in elementary school, I got her permission to share this slide. By the way, there were no diary entries. I'm using this as an example of how we view diaries over the passage of time. She was maybe six or seven. This is what she wrote. Dear reader, this is not, that is not me. Do not, I repeat, do not turn the page. It is my privacy. And if you do turn the page, you will die a horrible death by me. Love Nikki, P.S. I have a bazooka in my closet. It is filled with bullets, lather, swords, knives, and kittens with claws. And then she saw all the ways the person who wrote her diary would um, be killed if they looked at it. So that is just a kind of a fun example of how we view the privacy of diaries. Diaries and the passage of time. The concept of privacy changes from being a private record to another purpose, genealogical, historical, research and teaching. So before reading diaries, analyze it. Who wrote it? Male, female, young, older? What was the profession? Start looking at it with the analyzing eyes. Who did they write the diary for? Was it solely for the person writing the diary? Or is someone or others going to read the diary or journal? Knowing this will help us analyze the diary. Was there anything possibly held back in diary entries because of this? What is the context? Historic context means the information about the period, the place, the events that created, influenced, or formed the backdrop to the diary viewing what is written in a wider historical frame. How reliable is the information in the diary? Just remember, this is the truth as the writer sees it. Are there other resources that can back up or refute what is written? As we have seen, the manuscript collections include 40 collections with diaries. The description of the collections include biographical and historical content. And this is Sarah Elizabeth Fleming's diary. It's a little bit bigger. Right here, so you can see it. 1898 to 1900. I have never looked at this diary before I gave this presentation. But I was reading the notes of the collection and I found it interesting, so I thought I would use it. Under the notes, it says this diary covers the daily life of a female missionary at a Presbyterian mission in Suchow, China. Sarah Elizabeth, also known as Elizabeth or Lizzie, was born January 1st, 1839 in Augusta, Georgia, to Sarah Lamar and Porter Fleming. She spent her early years assisting in the rearing and education of her many half siblings and teaching in and around Augusta. A devout Presbyterian, Fleming was able in 1893 at the age of 54 to go as a missionary from the Southern Presbyterian Church to the Sibley home in Sucha, China, where she remained until her death on May 8, 1916. A note, the thing that sticks out to me is I think the age of 54 is unusual to go as a missionary. I wonder what happened there. So who wrote it? What did I expect? What was I looking for? Well, who wrote it? Sarah Elizabeth Fleming, she was middle aged. She was a single woman a Presbyterian missionary and teacher who wrote this diary at the age of 59. She was a missionary teacher at the Sibley home in Suchow, China. Now, 
what was I looking for? I had hoped to learn of the children she worked with, her teaching methods, just to find out some information about that, uh, what the names were, what the, they were like. Well, that's what I was looking for. Well, it wasn't there. And sometimes when you get a diary, sometimes you'll find things that are unexpected or maybe that you didn't, didn't expect or you're looking for something that's not there. Either way, they're really fun to look at. Okay, why did she write this? This is her first entry. It's written for her eyes only. So there's this candid honesty here. We do get an answer as to why at age 54 she became a missionary in China. She writes, I came to China keeping a promise to my heavenly father. He has truly dealt most kindly with his child. The first three years were not happy years, but the past year's year has been full of joy and peace. Okay, so we know why she became a missionary. She doesn't know when she made the promise and so what made this year happy and the other years not happy. We don't know that. Um, what is the context? All right, we know she spent most of her life in Georgia and so now she's in a totally different culture. On, February, on a February 15th, 1898 entry, she wrote, looking up, I see 14th. Just think, I could forget it was Valentine's Day. What pleasant memories cling to the past from my childhood. Up to now when I'm a gray-haired woman, yet my heart is so young and full of joy, I long for peace of heart that can come to those who love the Father. So we know why she's that. She made a question saying what, when she did. Um, readers' expectations. As I had said earlier, that I had hoped to find, learn about the children and the teaching methods. But going through the diary, I spent about an hour, hour and a half trying to find things in this diary. It talks about the weather, sickness, she has lots of friends, it talks about numbers attending Sunday school, but generally the notes about the children were, like she called them, the scholars. But in what I saw, none by name. Sometimes in a diary, something from the past can resonate with the present. This entry made me laugh because I'm telling you, almost everyone listening here can relate either with their own children or someone else's at a place, maybe you're in a closed area, perhaps on a plane ride. This is what she said on April 14th, 1898. At home all day studying and teaching my little scholars went to prayer meeting. Mr. Button led the service for us, but Baby Button sat just by me and kept such a racket. I could not have hear what was being said. He had to be carried out for the sake of peace. These missionary babies have more privileges than our US babies. I thought that was amusing. Let's go into the context again. It's mostly written in 1898 to 1899. There is one entry in 1900. What was going on there? It's the Boxer Rebellion, um, a movement that was anti-foreign, anti-colonial, and anti-Christian uprising in China. So this right here, this is where she was, and this is where the uprising was. So she had both Chinese and American friends and she was always receiving mail. She had to have heard about the rebellion, although geographically the school was far away, it still had to be terrifying. This is the second to the last entry in the diary. Let me make it bigger for you. Right here, I'm going to read it for you. Poor journal, we have been kept apart by so many unfavorable circumstances. No quiet by day, not much time at night. Perhaps it is just as well, I am glad we do not know what is before us, or else we might lose heart. God is merciful, God is love. 
Well, is she referring to the boxer rebellion? We, we don't know. We need the next diary to perhaps get a possible idea. We do not have one at the Georgia Archives, and I've looked all around trying to find one, and I can't find them. Was this the only diary she kept? We don't know. How reliable is the diary? Other documents are housed at the Presbyterian Historical Society in Pennsylvania. Um, this backs up, she was a missionary. There is no diary in the collection. It's lots of letters and other things. However, there is an obituary from 1916 that tells us a little bit more about Sarah Elizabeth Fleming. I'll just read a little bit from the obituary. At the top, the obituary states, she lived and labored continuously without a furlough for more than 23 years in Suja. Can you imagine working for 23 years without a break, without a vacation, a time off? She was a warm friend, a strict disciplinarian, a skillful teacher, a sincere Christian, and successful uh, missionary. She also notes, it also notes that she built up a girls' school from nothing to a large, well-ordered institution that has today, which is 1916, 70 pupils and stands as a monument to her courage, zeal, wisdom, perseverance, and faith. Now, I didn't read the whole diary, but scanned pages for keywords. I didn't see anything in detail about the school. That information may or may not be in the letters housed at the Presbyterian Historical Society. Okay, in the virtual vault, you can see this from home because you don't have to come in here to see this. We have a journal and a memoir. Uh, they're written by a daughter and father, William and Francis Few. The Francis Few journal is transcribed. The William Few memoir is not. They're in the ad hoc collection. Um, a diary and a journal are similar. A diary is mainly used to write things such as daily activities, how the day was spent, what was uh, done, like, like the Sarah Elizabeth Fleming diary. A journal is a record of significant experiences, it has feelings and reflections. A diary can too, they're just so, so similar. Here's an example of the few journal that you can read online. Frances Few was 19 when she wrote her journal. Um, it was uh, from 1808 to 1809, uh, a journal of the winter of Washington, D.C. She was the daughter of William Few, who represented Georgia at the Constitutional Convention of 1787 and was elected as Georgia's first United States Senator under the new Constitution. William Few and his family moved to New York City in 1799 when Francis was 10. In October 1808, when Frances was 19, she accompanied her Aunt Hannah, an uncle, U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, Albert Galton, to Washington, D.C. for the winter. This journal was not just for her eyes only. She was writing it for her sister Mary, describing her experiences. Um, the photograph on the left is her as an older lady, courtesy of, thank you, the Joint Archives of Holland. Uh, they gave me permission to use this. I had hoped to find a portrait painting, but did not. Now, coming from a prominent family, there probably was a portrait painted of her, but I couldn't find one, unfortunately. So who wrote it? Frances Hugh. She was privileged. She was bright, she was educated, she was, you will see, she's observant, 19-year-old. Um, she's from a family of politicians. Why did she write it? She wrote it for her sister Mary. It's not for her eyes only. So she's probably keeping in, in, in her mind that this is for her and her sister, they're very, very close. There is a candid honesty that you will see shortly. What is the context? It's written during our nation's infancy. Francis had access to powerful people in social settings. It doesn't take a long time to read. I would highly recommend going in there and reading it, particularly seeing as it's transcribed. Now keep in mind it was written for her sister. Context, the 
journal begins October the 1st, 1808. Thomas Jefferson is president. When she meets him, Thomas Jefferson is 65 years old. The visit is for pleasure. She is quite observant, as you will see. How reliable is the journal? Historically, very reliable. Other sources back it up. There is a lot in this journal that is extremely subjective, as you, on that, you will see on the next slide. Meeting Thomas Jefferson. It's October the 11th, 1808. I dined with the president. He is a tall, thin man, not very dignified in his appearance but very agreeable in his manners. His face expresses great good humor. There is scarce a wrinkle on his brow. He seems very happy. He wears powder, but is evident his hair is red. His complexion too is very red. His face is short and his nose and chin approach each other. Can't you kind of picture that? I can picture that. His teeth are good. He shows but little of them when he laughs. He stoops very much, but holds his head high. He was dressed in a pair of dark corduroy breeches, an old fringed dimity jacket that he brought with him from France, which reached down to his hips, a blue cloth coat with metal buttons, worsted stockings nicely drawn up, and a clean pair of leather shoes. She describes a lot of people this way. Some of them very kindly, some of them really not so kindly. She visited the capital and there were her observations on October the 1st, 1808. Uh, the wings of the capital are nearly finished. The body of the building is not yet begun. They're three stories high, built of stone. She goes in and then she describes the president's house. The president's house is built of the same material and surrounded by a wall of dark stone, which looks very much like the wall belonging to the state prison, but is not finished and may be improved on. Now, according to the White House Historical Association, the White House moniker began to appear in newspapers before the War of 1812. It was President Theodore Roosevelt who in 1901 designated the official name of the residence of the US president to be the White House. Um, this is from the Library of Congress, the Capitol. Dining with the president. This is October 11, 1808. This is a commentary on the culture of courts in Europe compared to the dining culture of a presidential visit, and it's kind of fun. When the minister from Denmark arrived here, he waited on the president. After conversing some time, Mr. Jefferson was surprised that his visitor did not take his leave. At length, every topic of conversation being exhausted both sat silent. You can just kind of picture that, can you? Yet the minister did not go. At last, dinner was evidently approaching. The minister then rose, rubbed his forehead, looked much distressed, made his bow and retired. He immediately went to another foreign minister and told him he feared he had made some strange mistake, for he'd been three hours with the president, waiting for him to order him to retire. The minister laughed and told him that the president of the United States did not order those who visited him to retire, but stayed with them till they thought proper to go themselves. Here we have Thomas Jefferson, Getty images. The president goes to bed at 10 o'clock, rises at five, works to one and then takes a ride on horseback. Now here's the subjective part. He is an excellent horseman, but very ungraceful. As to ceremony in show, he is really superior to it. First Lady Dolly Madison is credited with saving the portraits of George Washington, portrait of George Washington and other White House treasures when the British attacked the capital in 1814. She was vivacious and helped define the political and social role of a First Lady. The wife of James Madison, the fourth president of the United States from 1809 to 1817. Now she was noted for holding Washington social functions, which she invited members of both political parties. When Francis Few met her, 
She was, um, Dolly Madison was 40. Let's see Francis's observations. They're pretty key. Meeting Dolly Madison. Mrs. Madison is a handsome woman, looks much younger than her husband. She was, she was 17 young, years younger than James Madison. She is tall and majestic. Her man is affable, but a little affected. She has been very much admired and still fond of admiration. Loads herself with finery and dresses without any taste. And amidst all the finery, you might discover that in neatness, she is very deficient. Her complexion is brilliant. Her neck and bosom the most beautiful I ever saw. Her face expresses nothing but good nature. It is impossible, however, to be with her and not be pleased. There was something very fascinating about her. Yet, I do not think it possible to know what her real opinions are. She is all things to all men. Not the least of a prude, as one day she told an old bachelor and held up her mouth for him to kiss. She was also at the presidential inauguration of James Madison. She was a very privileged young lady with lots of connections to her family. I want you to kind of think about this. It's March the 4th, 1809. Mr. Madison this day took the inauguration oath and read a short speech to the most numerous assembly that I ever saw. Mr. Jefferson appeared one of the most happy among the concourse of people. The foreign ministers were at the Capitol, the gallery in every part of the house was crowded, and the number of carriages was so great that it was difficult to get to the door. From there, a great number went to Mr. Madison's. Now, think about it. Is this correct? Of Francis Hughes' observations about former President Thomas Jefferson appearing most happy, do you think they're correct? Well, I'd say yes, probably. Madison was, why? Because Madison was Thomas Jefferson's handpicked successor. The former president was happy to be free from executive duties, so her observation backs this up. Let's say you want to look at some diaries. Where to find some? Well, we've been looking at the Georgia archives, archives of diaries and collections. Historical societies, the Library of Congress, large genealogical libraries such as the Daughters of the American Revolution. Some are published. US Gen Web's uploaded diaries. Now, if you want to read some diaries, the Digital Library Georgia has diaries on there. Of course, you can go on Amazon or libraries for published diaries, eBay, diaries going out for auction, or maybe relatives. Lots of places to enjoy diaries. The Georgia Archives Reference Library, we talked a little bit about published diaries, and I'm just going to show you a few examples. Um, the War Outside My Window, Leroy Wiley Gresham of Macon, kept a series of actually seven journals between 1860 and 1865. Um, he was in Macon. He started at the age of 12, and unfortunately, he passed away of tuberculosis at age 17. Um, but these are his, his journals have been published. We have a variety of different types of um, diaries. And here's another example, um, the Fesh, uh, Sheftel Diaries, 1733 to 1808, Georgia's first Jewish colonists. Now going into the manuscript collections, we looked at this one already, the Sarah Elizabeth Fleming Diary. Um, here is an example right here of uh, many different types of diaries. This is in the Henry Johnson Tombs Personal Papers. Many times personal papers will have diaries. There is um, a 1941 travel diary by Tanya Tombs. I've not looked at it, so I'm presuming it's before we entered the war. Um, that would be interesting to look at. Here is the Amory Dexter Diary, 1861. It worked for mining companies, so that focuses on that. So difference between diaries and memoirs. 
A diary tells what happens within a specific time frame and is written about specific things. What happened, record of events, usually frequent, sometimes not so frequent um, intervals. Now a memoir is a little bit different. It's a non-fictional first personal account of events and memories from the author's real life. A memoir, French for memory or reminiscence. It focuses on personal experiences, um, imbues with um, emotional truth. The reason I'm bringing this up is because of William Few, Francis's um, father. Um, he was the fa her father and at Francis's request, he wrote a memoir for her of his life. So he shared stories, his memories with her. So it's not just for him, it's for her. He was an American Revolutionary War figure a delegate to the Constitutional Convention, one of Georgia's first U.S. Senators. In 1799, he moved to New York City, where he culminated his career as president of Citibank. His memoir covers his life from his childhood to adolescence, his participation in the American Revolution, political life in Georgia. The whole memoir is in the virtual vault, it is not transcribed, but anyone interested, particularly in the American Revolution in Georgia, will not be disappointed. I have read it all the way through. It's fascinating. Um, I have transcribed this part right here. There is no date on this entry, but it is during the American Revolution. Here's a screenshot from that. Let me read it here. The legislature of, the, of Georgia has ordered a treaty to be held with the Creek and Cherokee nations of Indians in order to negotiate an endeavor to establish a permanent peace with them. And I was appointed one of three commissioners for that purpose. Information was sent to the kings, head men and warriors, inviting them to meet us in Augusta for the purpose of burying the hatchet and living in friendship. Well, this is written as a memory during the American Revolution. The context is both the British and Americans are trying to get support uh, from Native Americans uh, for their side. Um, and here the Americans wanted to live in peace because they didn't want the Creeks and the Cherokees on the side of the British. Um, spoiler alert, um, it, the friend, it didn't work out. The friendship didn't work out on the next page. Donating diaries or journals. Archives and historical societies have collecting policies. So if you want to donate a diary or journal, um, look into these policies to see the best fit. For example, uh, the Georgia Archives accepts donations of family and organizational papers and records that are closely associated with state government because we're state archives. Um, you can find an appropriate home, consider donating to a library or uh, archive. Perhaps family members or friends would keep them for you. Start locally, your local library or archives or special collections. Um, certain archives exist to, to collect materials related to certain categories. Um, archives have mission statements. Would your diary fit into their collecting policy? Now, there is currently no national American diary archive. Although there are diaries in archives and historical society and collections, but there's no national diary archive. There is one in Italy, um, the National Diary Archive and uh, the City of Diaries. They have 7,000 diaries and memoirs. And there's also something really neat is the Great Diary Project in the United Kingdom. Um, it was launched in 2007 by two diary devotees. Um, Dr. Irving Finkel and Dr. Polly North. Um, there's a permanent home at Bishopsgate Institute. The project rescues archives, rescues archives and makes publicly available a collect, growing collection of more than 15,000 unpublished diaries. Um, private diaries of ordinary people are the core study selection. Diaries are collected, the Great Diary Project collects diaries from the United Kingdom and other countries, including the United States. 
Now, the professionals working on the Great Diary Project are keen to rescue unwanted diaries, and useful details are on their website. Um, there's uh, Dr. Polly North and Dr. Irvin Finkel and Stefan Dickers, um, two founders and then the library and archives manager of the Great Diary Project, which I think is kind of, is kind of fun. There is Bishopsgate Institute, so you can find diaries you know, all over. All right, let's see this quote. Writing, let's see, let's end the presentation on diaries with a quote from a famous diary. Let's see if you can guess what it is. Writing a diary is a really strange experience for someone like me, not only because I've never written anything before, but also because it seems to me that later on, neither I nor anyone else will be interested in the musings of a 13 year old. Schoolgirl, oh well, it doesn't matter. I feel like writing and I have an even greater need to get all kinds of things off my chest. Who do you think wrote this? Give you time to think about it. I think you know. Anne Frank, the diary of a young girl or the diary of Anne Frank. Um, diary notes, so famous. Okay, do we have any questions? I can look on my conversation and see if there are any questions before I tell you about upcoming virtual presentations. Okay, Andrew, are there any unique personal details or preferences for these individuals that can only be found in their diaries? Ooh, yes, that is really, really a good question, Andrew. Um, I would say that the William Few um, memoir, he goes into such detail about George's involvement in the American Revolution. You will see things in there that maybe are generally covered in books, but he goes specifically into those, into those uh, reasons what happened, particularly with Georgia and the American Revolution. It's great. Thank you for that question. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so let us go on. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go on and tell you about some upcoming presentations. Okay, the first is on Saturday, February the 5th, Reconstruction African American History and Genealogy Day. Now you can register from our website, www.georgiaarchives.org, or go on our Facebook page to see this flyer. Now you'll have to download a Microsoft, you, you know that because you're on it, <laughs> a Microsoft Teams app. Um, it's going to be really, really good. That's going to start at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. Let's see our next one. Upcoming presentations. The second virtual presentation is our Lunch and Learn on Friday, February the 11th. Now, once again, you know, you can register from our website. Um, this is a February Lunch and Learn virtual presentation. And it's interesting because we just talked, we talked about um, the trustees, um, the Earl of Egmont. This right here is the founding of Georgia, 1732 to 1734. How the Georgia trustees vetted potential first settlers or colonists and recruited Londoners to settle on the Georgia frontier, including using the newspapers to alert any creditors. That sounds interesting. It's by Kenneth H. Thomas Jr., Atlanta Journal Constitution columnist, Friday, February 11th, from noon to 1 p.m. Also, what you can do is this presentation, these presentations will be added to our YouTube channel. Just go onto YouTube and type in Georgia Archives and you're right there. 
if you subscribe and it's free, um, you will be alerted whenever we have new videos on now. Also, you can view our next fourth Friday from the archives presentation will be in March. You can view our upcoming 2022 program schedule from our website. Just go under announcement, go under announcements and click on that and you'll see what's coming up. Well, we are so glad that you have joined us today and happy reading. <laughs>